Okay, this is the fourth part of lecture one on algebraic geometry, and we will be continuing with some examples of applications of algebraic geometry. So first we will discuss Kakaya sets. So Kakaya sets are actually something from real analysis. So a Kakaya set, well, there are two slightly different definitions. The difference doesn't really matter that much for our purposes. The first definition says that it's a set such that if you've got a unit line, you can turn the line all the way around. So obviously you can do that if um, you've got a circle of diameter one, then you can turn around a line of diameter one in a circle. You can do a little bit better by taking a triangle of height one, and then if you think about it very quickly, you can see you can turn this line around inside the triangle. Um, and Kaikaya suggested that the, the minimum possible set was this sort of, um, um, I can't remember what it's called. Um, however, Besikovich showed that in fact there was no lower limit to the size of a set in which you could turn around a unit interval. Um, so the the, 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 however small a number is, you can find a set of area smaller than that in which you can turn around a unit interval. Slight variation of the definition of a Kakaya set says that it's just a set containing a unit line in every direction, whether or not you can actually turn the line from, from one direction to another direction. Um, so Kakaya sets um, are, turn out to be important in um, high dimensional harmonic analysis. And one harmonic analyst called Tom Wolfe suggested a finite field analogue of the Kakaya set. So um, this is um, his, his not quite the same as the two novelists called Thomas Wolfe because his name is spelt slightly differently. It's got two Fs at the end. Anyway, um, he had a sort of finite field kayak, kayak conjecture. Oops. So he, he asked over a finite field, um, the size of a kaya set over F um, in F to the N, so this is a finite field, is at least Cn F to the N. So this is some constant depending on N. This is the size of the finite field F. And a Kakaya set means it has to contain a line in every direction. So F to the N is a vector space, so it's reasonably clear what is meant by a line and the direction of a line. And a Kakaya set is just one that contains lines in every direction. And the, 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 so, so Wolf's conjecture said that this Kakaya sets can't be too small. Um, and this was proved by, by De Vere in 2008, and he showed you could prove this with Cn being 1 over n factorial. And um, his proof was amazingly short for a problem that everybody thought was going to be um, um, kind of rather difficult. So we'll describe his proof. It has two steps. Um, step one says that a Kakaya set cannot lie in a hypersurface of small degree. And um, step two says that if a set is small, we can find a hypersurface of small degree containing it. So if you put these together, it says that a Kakaya set can't be too small. 
So step one, a cacao set. in f to the n cannot lie in a hypersurface of degree d less than the order of f. And already this is a slightly funny result because Kakaya sets seem to have nothing to do with hypersurfaces. Um, they're just a sort of combinatorial um, subset of um, um, vector spaces of a finite field. So it's a little bit surprising that hypersurfaces are appearing in this. Um, well, the proof of this is fairly short. Suppose F is a polynomial of degree D, which is less than the order of F, defining some hypersurface, which um, is a Kakaya set. And then um, we let FD be the highest degree component Um, so for any V, we can find X so that F X plus V T um, vanishes for all T. And if you think about it, this is just... Um, what is meant by the zeros of F being a Kakaya set. So this just says that F vanishes on this line. Um, so it's saying for any direction V, we can find a line such that F vanishes. So that's a consequence of it being a Kakaya set. Um, so um, the coefficient f d v um, of t to the d vanishes. Um, so this is true for any v. And FD has degree less than F. So FD must actually be equal to zero. And this is because a polynomial of degree less than the order of F cannot vanish at all points of F. This is just saying that a polynomial of some degree, um, this number of roots must be at most the degree. Um, so, um, so the terms of highest degree of f vanish, so f must be equal to zero. So we assume that our polynomial had degree less than the number of elements of the finite field f, and we find and the places where it vanished form a Kakaya set, and we find f must be zero. So that shows that a Kakaya set cannot vanish on a hypersurface of degree that's too small. That's the first part of the proof. So the second part says um, we observe that the polynomials of degree um, at most f minus 1 form a vector space of dimension um, n plus f 
minus one, choose n. So this is just a binomial coefficient. Um, so this is an easy result that I will just um, leave people to do because I'm feeling too lazy to prove it. So we can find a hypersurface of degree at most f minus 1 vanishing um, on any set with um, less than this number of points. And this follows by linear algebra, because the condition that um, a polynomial vanish at a point is some sort of linear relation between its coefficients. Um, and if we've got a vector space of this dimension and a smaller number of linear conditions on it, then there must be at least one element of this vector space at least one non-zero element of this vector space satisfying all these conditions. In other words, there is some polynomial vanishing on all these points, provided the number of points is less than the dimension of this vector space of polynomials. So let, let's put these two together. The Kakaya set cannot lie on a hypersurface of degree less than f, but if it had less than this number of points than it could. So a Kakaya set has at least this number n plus f minus 1 choose n points. And now we just observe n plus f minus 1 choose n is just equal to f times f plus 1 up to f plus n minus 1 over 1 times 2 up to n, which is greater than or equal to f to the n over n factorial, which is exactly the bound we wanted. A Kakaya set must have at least um, some power of the number of elements of the finite field times some constant. So that's the end of a proof. It's a kind of rather remarkable proof proof of a apparently hard theorem that you can fit on the back of a postcard. Just move that up a bit so you can see this formula I wrote. Um, final example I wanted to mention to end this lecture with is just a very famous example of 27 lines on a cubic surface. Um, this is sometimes said to be the beginning of high dimensional algebraic geometry. It was almost the first non-trivial result if you don't count things like Bezu's theorem. Um, so I'm not going to prove it, I'm just going to give an example. So this is 27 lines on a cubic surface. So Cayley and Salmon proved that any cubic surface has exactly 27 lines on it as long as it's non-singular. I'm just going to cheat. Instead of doing it for all cubic surfaces, I'm just going to do it for one cubic surface. And I'm going to take the easiest possible one. Let's take w cubed plus x cubed plus y cubed plus c cubed equals naught in three-dimensional projective space. So I'd better explain notation for projective space here because we seem to have four coordinates and I've only got three dimensions. Well, projective space is, three-dimensional projective space is the set of all quadruples of numbers, W, X, Y, Z, except that this is considered to be the same point as lambda W, lambda X, lambda Y, 
lambda z for lambda not equal to zero. So for example, if z is non-zero, then you can multiply it by lambda to make z equal to one. And you find the set of points with z non-zero can just be identified with the set of points w, x, y, one, which is isomorphic to three-dimensional space over whatever field you're working with. I guess we're working over the complex numbers for the moment. So um, if Z is non-zero, three-dimensional projective space, the, the points of projective space with Z non-zero just form a copy of the three-dimensional affine space. And similarly, um, we could take the points with Y, X, or W non-zero, and those would form three more copies. So altogether, projective space is covered by four copies of affine space. Anyway, this is why we seem to have four variables for three-dimensional space. Anyway, so this gives a, a hypersurface, and now we want to write down 27 lines. Well, I can write down one line. One line could be the set of points A minus A, B minus B. Obviously, A cubed plus minus A cubed plus B cubed plus minus B cubed equals zero. So that's a perfectly good line as we vary A and B. We seem to be varying two things, but remember with the projective space, this is the same point if you multiply everything by constant. So this is really one dimensional. And now we can permute the coordinates. So we can move this minus a to any three positions there. And we can multiply by omega where omega is a cube root of one. So we can multiply a minus a by a cube root of one or minus b by a cube root of one. And if you think about it carefully, this gives three times three times three possibilities, which is 27 possibilities. So altogether, we get 27 obvious lines. Um, OK, so I guess that's the end of the first lecture. Um, the next lecture, we will start more systematically studying affine space.